What would you say the most hated thing in the world would be? Would it be sin? Would it be war? Would it be poverty? <clears throat> Covetousness? Greed? Pride? A number of other things we could put there. But while you entertain what you might put there as an answer to what you think the most hated thing in the world is, listen to this passage in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. This is Jesus speaking as John by inspiration records him. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds be reproved. Again, that's John 3, 19 and 20. Night may seem quite strange to some, But I think from the totality of the Bible teaching as well as this one verse that the Word of God is the most hated thing on earth for the reasons Christ gave in that verse and other places. Going back to the Old Testament, the great weeping prophet Jeremiah who were in the last days of Judah treated terribly told of the conditions in Judah in his day. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. If you go back before him to the Messianic prophet Isaiah, of his generation, he spoke, and basically in the same vein that Jeremiah did. In Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 and 10. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, Speaking to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. We understand after such scriptures as that by faithful prophets that God sent to Israel and Judah, why that Israel was taken into captivity and basically as far as the northern kingdom was concerned, really was never heard much of again. And then Nebuchadnezzar came for the same reason and took the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem and so on into captivity. Looking back at one of those most recognized as one of the wickedest people on this earth is King Ahab of Israel. And he said this of God's prophet who spoke to him the word of God. I hate him, for he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. That's been the way that people who live contrary to the truth and oppose the truth have always operated. Because this man never taught him anything but what God put in his mouth to tell him. But because his heart was set on going contrary to God's will, then the good, the truth, was evil. And what was bad and evil, he considered good. I think the attitude of many is revealed in Acts 7.57. Now, if you look and study about Stephen, he went to the synagogue of the freedmen because he is a Hellenistic Jew. His own name is Greek. And this was a synagogue that was built in Jerusalem for those people to worship. So he went into his own people and preached Jesus Christ. And when he preached to them, and they didn't like what he said, 
the Word, the light that Jesus talked about. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, and we know the outcome of that. He becomes the first Christian martyr. So it's been, in general, to one extent or the other, throughout the history of mankind. In general, people have hated the truth. Uh, may I say, especially about themselves, such an attitude caused the apostle to ask even brethren who needed rebuking because they had gone off after false doctrine, am I, the apostle Paul, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth, Galatians 4.16? And the truth to that answer to that question, and many people, yeah, you have, you have. Of course, an atheist is one who says God does not exist. There are no spiritual anything. And they hate the word of truth primarily because it means that if there is a God, He created me and I must be subject to Him. And He doesn't want to be. When you look back at the history in Europe of what we know as the Dark Ages, coming out of that, there was the among the Roman Catholics, the Spanish Inquisition. There was, at the time of the Reformation, all kinds of punishment if you didn't do what certain ones thought you should, and that wasn't just all having to do with Roman Catholicism. They thought, in the name of God, they could do many wicked things. But the question is why? God gave us the word to show us how to go to heaven. Why do people hate it? What is there about the Word of God that would cause anyone to hate it? And for those who preach it and will not compromise, those who hate it attack them as they did Stephen, as they did the prophets of old, as they have all down through history. Well, one reason is that the Word of the living God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, destroys those who array themselves against it, who oppose it. How powerful is the Word of God? And what has God promised us about the Word of God? Well, Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. I think about that when I see all the people who ignore the Word of God, won't study it in the church and out, all those who are as ignorant of it as they could be. Uh, they just simply do as they please. People have tried to destroy, down through the years, to destroy the Word. One of the most uh, quoted ones or named is Voltaire, who lived the latter part of the 18th century, a philosopher. He was very proud and bold, and he bragged that within 30 years the Bible would be a forgotten book, but he, Voltaire, would be remembered as the one who had destroyed it. Well, some of you, when I use the word Voltaire, remember, maybe never heard of Voltaire, and there's a lot of folks who haven't. But the Word of God's still here. And that's important to remember. When you look in the Old Testament again, you have the wicked Queen Jezebel who opposed the Word of God and opposed God's prophets who faithfully declared it. And, of course, that meant she opposed Elijah, who spoke that word. Her death was a perfect fulfillment of Elijah's prophecy. In 2 Kings chapter 9, 36 through uh, 37, in the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel. Some people who want to be dainty might not like the way the prophets very descriptively described what would happen to certain people, and they Certainly this was true in Elijah's prophecy of Jezebel. It's foolish to oppose 
the Word of God today. The promise is still very clear. The Word of the Lord abideth forever. And this is the Word of the Gospel that was preached unto you. So Peter declared to Christians long ago in writing part of the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25. All of these people that we read of that have arrayed themselves against God, have opposed His Word, so many of them are so forgotten. I've lived long enough to even note some that were very prominent in the news and politics and other things 50 years ago or back. And the host of people, they don't know who they are. But at that time, they might be the name that was very prominent in the nation. But they were not interested in God or His Word. They were highly interested in other things. But the Word of God cannot be destroyed. It will destroy evil. Whether we, anchored to time and space and this finite people, see it all happen makes no difference. God's not governed by time. A day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, Peter said. But he, in his own, quote, good time, will bring things to pass and ultimately will destroy all evil as we studied about last week. The Word of God, and we mentioned this a little bit earlier, shows us who we really are. There's some people who have a very high estimate of themselves. But does God have that same estimate of them? Would they change their view of themselves if they really knew the Word of God? James talks about it being a mirror, that if we look into it, we will see ourselves. And if we're honest, We'll make the necessary adjustments what we see to bring our lives in subjection to God's will. James chapter 1, verse 24, and verse also 25. Jesus said, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, John 3, 20. Now think about that for a minute. Everyone, leave anybody out, that does evil, that's contrary to the will of God, hates the light. We sometimes try to talk about real good people and try to think of people who will not obey the gospel as good people. No, they're children of the devil. That doesn't mean we hate them. In fact, it means we love them. We want them to change. We want them to be converted. We want them to become Christians. But when they will not embrace the word of the Lord and do as he says, they remain opposed to the light of truth. If we are selfish, then the Bible will reveal that to us if we'll study it. If we're motivated by revenge instead of love, that word reveals us to ourselves. Here's what the inspired Apostle Paul wrote. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. How powerful and good that word is. And we need to ask ourselves, can I, really, can I really handle it to see myself? Not as my wife sees me, not as my husband sees me, not as my parents see me, or any other human, but as God sees me. How do I know how God sees me? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means spiritually complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So the Word of God shows Christ as our pattern to follow, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, and thereby shows us what we should be and can be if we're willing to follow its teaching and be sacrificial in doing so. One of the purposes of the Bible is to, and it ties on to what I've just said, is to shine in our lives. We need to be able to improve ourselves. Nobody surely thinks once they obey the gospel that they're a mature Christian. They're babes in Christ. How do you mature? How do you grow? How do you develop? 
How do you get more of a spiritual insight in things and understand why you're here and what you're doing, what you should put first and so on? It has to be through improving ourselves through greater knowledge of the truth and the application of the same. And we've talked about this. I just mentioned some of it a moment ago when I cited James 1, and 25. But here's what, what it says. And here's the beginning of all of it. When you know it's God's will directed to you and you are to comply with it, here's what he said to Christians. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in the mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But he that looketh into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and so continueth, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that worketh. This man shall be blessed in his deed or his doing. The word is so set up that when we see our obligations to God, see that we're out of harmony with it, see what we ought to do because we want to do it, that we have to put it into practice so that we can see other things so that we can grow and develop, so that we'll have a view of this world as God intended. So that word then not only reveals what we are, what we should be, and what we can be, it reveals to us what we must be, what we can be and must be. As we look into the Word of God, notice what is said in 2 Corinthians 3.18 by Paul. We behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're transformed, as that's happening, into the same image from glory to glory. Think what he said there. We become more like Christ in character and outlook and thinking and planning and purposing. But it only happens when we don't run from the Word. If you ever read your Bible and been sitting there and all of a sudden it kind of hits you in the face like a cold water on one of these hot days, say, whoop. I think I slipped here. Folk, that's good. But then what you do with it tells a whole lot about your character. Do you say, I've got to straighten that up. There's something right then. You can pray about it right then. If you need to bring it before the church because it's public brought reproach on the church, you can do it then, but you can pray about it then. God knows. And he knows what you're doing with what you have to do with, where you are, and the opportunity. But he knows you want to do God's will. How does he know? He sees you do it. <laughs> That's what. For those people who are willing to look honestly at themselves as the Bible reveals, then that word is a great blessing. And where else are you going to go to see yourself as God sees you? Where else? But for those who love darkness rather than light, John 3, 19, then that word's hated because it exposes them what they'd rather not admit. And they don't intend to change. None of us likes change, really. But becoming a Christian demands change, the greatest of changes. And going through life, living the Christian life, will cause change all the time. I mentioned to my wife here a while back, and I said it off and on. If I hadn't desired to be faithful to the Lord and saw at that time as a teenager that I thought the best thing I could do to do the Lord's work was become a preacher, and my parents certainly knew this, I don't like change, I would have stayed right in Camden, Arkansas, got me a job there and stayed home because I hated leaving home. I've never liked to leave home. I wasn't ready to leave home when I left high school. I liked home. It was always a secure place. But things of God demand that you change. So we make those changes. To make a drastic change in the way we live is more than a challenge to most of us. It demands a lot of things from our thinking and planning and doing things we don't like doing things we don't like because it's right. 
learning to love things because it's what God says we ought to love. The Bible then does that for us. It shows us what we ought to love and what we ought not love. It shows us what we ought to be doing and what we ought not be doing. It demands that we change. Paul wrote to the Romans, Christians in Rome, in Romans 3, and I look at verse 10 and verse 23. There's none righteous, no, not one. Then when you go down to verse 23, you know what it means. We quote it most often, or what it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are people that just do not want to look into the Bible and have the Bible say, you're a sinner. Like Nathan of old did to David regarding his sin, thou art the man. The Bible will do that to you. If you honestly study it, it will come right back on you and say, you're the man. Because your sins have separated between you and your God, Isaiah said of those his day, Isaiah 59, 2. That's what separates us from God is our sins. I've said it all through my preaching life. The greatest enemy I have is sin. There's nothing else. God in his word demands that we leave a life of sin. We leave it. Get away from it. We don't practice it anymore. We hate it. Then we notice what is said even concerning the coming of Jesus. He will save his people from their sins, Matthew one twenty one, But he will not do it if you don't want to be saved from your sins. He will not save you against your will. That's why he says, Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So notice that Jesus did not come to save people in their sins, but to save people from their sins. The Bible makes the demand that we stop sinning. And to the Jews of Jesus' day, in Luke 13, 3, he said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There's simply no other choice. It's change, repent, or perish. And that repentance may demand a lot of us. That's the reason it's so good at a young age before you become steeped in various habits and involvements and this, that, and the other to remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You live your life a certain way for so many years, and that way is contrary to the teaching of the Bible. It gets harder to change. You have to give up so much sometimes. So you begin as early as you can to know God's will, to love it, and to do it. But whether you're 15, or whether you're 40, or whether you're 60, the change is demanded. Regardless of your age, if you're accountable to God for your actions, God demands repentance. Jesus Christ, who was in the beginning with God, John tells us in John 1, 1 and 2, as he tells us that the Word was God, left heaven, left the form of God, and came to this world to die for us and take on himself the form of man, that is, to become a human being. And he knew that the end of his days on this earth would be his death. Oh, what an ignominious, painful, horrible death it was. He knew all that. He knew that's the way it would be ended up. The love of Christ, Paul wrote, constraineth us. Because we thus judge that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all. That they that live should no longer live unto themselves but unto him who for their sakes died and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. That's a message he wanted those Christians long ago to learn. He wants all Christians to learn. We don't live to ourselves. So much about us in America and the Western world is me, me, me. And if it doesn't affect me right, then I'm all upset. But we don't give too much thought about what I'm doing and not doing, how it 
hits the other person. It's a matter of what you're trying to restrict me from. Jesus did not go to Calvary so that we could live as we wanted. He just didn't. He died so that we would live, as Paul said, unto, that's in order to a given end, live unto him. And unless we're willing to make that kind of change that's demanded by the word of the living God, then as we learned in the beginning, we hate the light of the word because it reveals to us that we're falling far short. The apostle asks and answers the question, and he does so for all time. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? People who obey the gospel and believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. They're raised to walk from the watery grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4, verses 17 and 18. And that simply means that we no longer practice sin. Or as a human being, we will stumble from time to time. But we're keenly aware of that. We're working on it. We don't try to justify ourselves when we see our sins. We readily want to repent of them and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And that's how Paul wrote to Christians in Rome in Romans 6, 22. Wouldn't he write the same to you and me today concerning our living the Christian life? that we do not want to live an habitually purposed life of sin. Oh, no, we live an habitually purposed life of obeying Christ. The Bible doesn't simply advise. This is the way a lot of people like to think of things today. They don't want to be told they must do much of anything or not do it, as the case may be. And they like to think of God saying, well, now, understand, this may be the best path for you, but Another path may be the best path for somebody else. And you hear people saying there's more than one path way to God. But nobody ever said that who taught what the Bible says. The Word commands us what to do. This is politically incorrect in our day and time. Nobody tells anybody. They jump up in their face and pop them in the head the Coke bottle or something. Well, let's just face it. Most of us do not like to be told that we must do anything. And if you look to the psychologists, they'll even tell you why it's a bad thing to make your children do something. We should persuade them. Well, I have no problem with persuading children. I was persuaded a lot of times. Daddy had a belt, and it was persuasive. There's sometimes as you get older and you're more mature mentally, you can try to explain and teach and train and set a good example as to why kids should do this and why you should do that. But uh, uh, try that with a two, three, four, five-year-old. Set him down and make out a syllogism, a logical syllogism, and let him understand it. No, you have to... Part of rearing children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and training them up in the ways that they should go, is making them do what's right. Because mom and daddy said so. Oh, psychologists will go crazy when you say because mom and daddy said so. Well, the Bible does not try to talk us into a course of action. The Word commands us, and there are dire consequences if we refuse to obey it. Notice how Jesus said it. Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then he said this, except, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And to the believers on the day of Pentecost, having heard and understood the word of Christ, the gospel, he tells them, having cried out to Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37 he says, as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Acts 8, 24. Luke 13, 3. Acts 2, verse 38. It's just the way it is. You sometimes say, well, it's this way or the highway. 
What are we saying when we say that? There are no options. There's no options. If you look at everything about the book of Acts, as they went out early to preach the gospel from the beginning all through the book of Acts, they did not give people options, except you can obey or not obey. If you come to Christ, you must obey him. And Christ would stand. Imagine a man like Christ standing among those Jews and saying, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's what got him nailed to a cross. But he still says that today because he is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, who has all authority given him by the Father in heaven and on earth. Jesus asked then that question. I call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, Luke 6, 46. You know, it's very easy for people to claim Jesus as Savior with no real change or commitment in their lives. But if they look at the Scriptures, understand the Scriptures, then they'll see it's another story. That they can't just say, well, Jesus is my Lord. i will go out and have a beer. I'll go out and lie on this contract. They can't do that. They may be deceived to think they can, but they can't. That's why we're told over and over again, the Word of God will read and mean the same thing on day of judgment means right now. In Acts 2, 41 and 47, it is said of those who were baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ when the Lord started the church, as many as received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. And then going down from 41 to 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That hasn't changed. When people accept Jesus, they accept what he said. It's ridiculous to say, well, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. But all the time, you're not willing to do God's will. We must do what he said. But, as Jesus said in the beginning, many prove they hate the light rather than love it because they still say, Jesus is my Lord, but don't expect me to obey him. Well, I said already, but we'll say it again, the word of God's going to judge us in the last day. Now, a few of us, in this, speaking generally of the whole nation, the world, like to think of being judged if we have to go to traffic court for a speeding ticket, we usually get sort of nervous. But the Word of God reveals the certainty of judgment. And that means we're going to be consigned to eternal damnation in hell with the devil and his angels, or we're going to be able to enter heaven to the glory that's beyond the mind to grasp. The admonition is still plain, and I hope one thing, and I'll say it here, has come out about this lesson. And I try to make all of them as much as I can this way. These are fundamental first principle things that affect everything about a Christian life, regardless of how much you grow and learn deeper matters of the truth of Christ and live closer to the Lord. And this passage right here fits it. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. There's no dodging that. Then again, what we've learned in studying the book of Hebrews, it's appointed unto men once to die. Then comes the judgment. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Chapter 9, 27 of Hebrews in chapter 10, 30 and 31. Jesus, of course, tells us about that judgment in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Finally and forever, the righteous are going to be separated from the wicked. And the wicked, I'm sad to say, but it'll be rightfully so, and it's very plain. We'll hear the Lord say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 41. That's the Jesus who right now says, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's the lamb. At the end of time, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
because they're going to depart into a place. I suppose some people think they say, I'm not going. I don't really quite understand that. But we see where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not, Mark 9, 48. That's not a popular subject. A lot of people just try to do away with it, as we studied last week. The Bible reveals that we shall be judged, sentenced, if you please. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Paul said that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether it be good or bad. So while the basis of the judgment will be our lives here, the decision will not be based on our standards, nor on the standards of our fellow men. It will be the will of the living God, the Word of God, the New Testament of the Christ. That's where we go to find what's right and what's wrong as God defines the same. And as we close the lesson, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John twelve forty eight. What is the word of God to you? What is the word of God to you? The Apostle Paul wrote, The word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 And I hope the latter part of that verse is what it is to us. We studied in this sermon what to do to become a Christian. If you're a child of God and sin, you need to know, you need to change, you need to repent from that. And you need to confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. The most hated thing in the world is to the church, should be, the most loved thing in the world. Because without it, I don't know anything about God, Christ, what I'm to be, how to get through life, where I came from, what I'm here for, and where I'm going. I don't know a thing about it. I remain in ignorance and lost in that ignorance. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we urge you to obey the gospel now while you have time, while we stand and sing.